So it's Christmas, and in light of 2020 being such a terrible year, and yes, you bought shares in bog roll, hand sanitizer, and face masks back in February, the likelihood that many of us won't get to spend Christmas with our extended families, and certain heritage railways won't be able to make any money from the Santa season, I hope that we can share some cheer by looking at adaptations of a beloved railfans classic, whether we love it or have seen it so many times that we may have grown tired of it. I am, of course, referring to The Railway Children, penned by Edith Nesbitt way back in 1906. The story of three ordinary upper-middle-class suburban children who were suddenly forced to sell up and move with their mother to the middle of nowhere following the mysterious departure of their father has continued to inspire and entertain generations of people, bringing fame and fortune to the heritage railway scene and filling theatres everywhere with stage show after stage show. In this retrospective study, we'll be focusing on three adaptations made for film and television. Interestingly, the story has been adapted for a television series four times, but due to the short-sightedness of broadcasters in their early days, the only television adaptation that's known to survive was the Dennis Constant Duros version from 1968. This was shot on the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway in its very early years, being one of the few standard gauge heritage lines around at that time and featuring all of the physical elements that the story needed. Vintage locomotives and rolling stock, embankments, a tunnel, some rural station buildings that remained pretty much untouched by VR, and so on. The results are, to be honest, a little bit primitive. While there's a few locomotive workings in there which the enthusiast might look back on with some fondness, like Manning Wardle Saddle Tank Sir Barclay and J72 number 69023 Joe M, the show hasn't really aged that well by comparison to the others. The majority of the acting is somewhat hammy with a few delayed cues and not a lot of investment involved from the kids. For one thing, the dramatic moments don't seem to be quite as dramatic as perhaps they could be. When Peter's model steam engine blows up in the original story and subsequent adaptations, it's a big deal, as it's not just Peter's pride and joy that's been ruined, but it's the beginning of the chain of events that unravel for the whole family. Here, though, it just falls off the table. Huh, who'd have thought a clockwork engine could be defeated from such a short drop? Smokey Joe's usually tougher than that. The standout performance that perhaps doesn't seem entirely uncomfortable is Jenny Agata as Bobby, although the scene where she faints does seem a little bit phoned in considering she does it while off the track. The adult actors are also generally fine, but because we spend so much time with the children, their performances don't leave that much of an impact. All in all, it's a charming serial with some unique scenes of the Worth Valley in its infant years, but maybe the story deserved a bit more. Two years later, the same railway would play host to the feature film version directed by Lionel Jeffries. Arguably, this is the adaptation that people remember the most, seeing as it's usually been repeated at Christmas year after year for as long as anybody can remember. The child acting in this one is much more solid, mostly because the actors in the children roles were maturing teenagers. By this time, Gary Warren, who plays Peter, was 16. Jenny Agata reprised her role as Bobby at the age of 17, and Sally Tom says who plays Phyllis was entering her 20s. Although, for contractual reasons, she wasn't actually allowed to tell that to the public. You get the feeling there's more chemistry between these three than there was in the TV serial. The adult actors were also big stars for their time. Bernard Cribbins playing the energetic and endearing Mr. Perks, William Mervyn of all Gas and Gators fame playing the warm-hearted old gentleman, and Diana Sheridan of Genevieve fame returning to film acting for the first time in 17 years as the mother. There doesn't seem to be a performance out of place here. Even local extras and Keithley volunteers filling in the on roll here and there. On the way, Mr. Mitchell! And give it to Bert! The only minor issues that people might have is that there is the odd scene here and there which was in the book but not featured here. Cribbins also improvised most of his dialogue, so it could be argued that his role has been tailored more for him than it has for the story. But to be honest, these points not only keep the spirit of the story, but they elevate it. And to anybody who took issue with the LMS Fairburn tank being painted in Caledonian Railway Blue, because apparently that's the equivalent of slapping a Tesla badge on a Ford Model T, oh boy, it really doesn't look like you'll take kindly to the Barton Wright Goods logo painted up in bright green or the pannier tank in Stroudley colours, or the N2, which is referred to as the fastest thing on the line, but is then given this tongue-in-cheek observation about speed limits on a light railway that's pretending to be the big main line. Why is it going so slowly, Mr. Perks? Well, well, it's all uphill to Scotland, isn't it? This film was such a surprise at the box office that it went on to become the ninth best-selling film of the year. Mind you, when you look at some of the competition, it's kind of easy to see why. I mean, can you imagine feeling good about life after watching Pattern, or M.A.S.H., or Ryan's Daughter? 
There was a lot of really grim material coming out of 1970, wasn't there? What's more, it easily put the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway on the map. Until then, a few hundred people a day might turn up to trundle on a two-coach service, but within days of the film's release, the railway reported trains being so full that they had to turn passengers away and had to ask them to come back again later. People can say what they like about individuals and organisations that endlessly brag on and on about their achievements, and they're perfectly right to do so. But much like the Harry Potter franchise bringing financial benefit to the West Coast mainline fleet of locos, this heartfelt motion picture did more for railway preservation in West Yorkshire than people care to imagine. Finally, we come to the made-for-TV adaptation produced by Carlton Television in the year 2000. Starring Jemima Rupert, Claire Thomas and Jack Blumenau, this was filmed at the Bluebell Railway in late 1999. Much like the Jeffries film, there's an all-star cast in this version, with Richard Attenborough as the old gentleman, Scotch and Rye and Rab C. Nesbitt star Gregor Fisher as Perks, and Jenny Agatha now taking the role of the mother, which resulted in this tongue-in-cheek moment being lifted from the book. I've been meaning to ask you, when you go down to the station, you won't walk on the line, will you? Well, didn't you ever walk on the railway lines when you were little? Yes. There didn't seem to be a lot of point in this version on face value, as the Jeffries film seemed to captivate the charm and spirit of the original story, but watching both versions in correlation to reading the book, this one lifts more scenes and dialogue directly from said book. One of these is how Peter's engine was repaired. In the BBC version, Phyllis approaches one of the drivers at the station, and in the Jeffries film, Perks repaired the engine. But here, the repair is more faithful to the source material, where Bobby takes it to one of the footplate crews and accidentally gets hooked in on a cab ride, lucky her, which results in a relation of the footplate crew mending it for her. Another nod to the book is when the children try to befriend the local canal workers but get nowhere with it. Hello, excuse me. What's the time? And I dropped my watch in the water butt and it doesn't... Mind your own business, posh bloody kids. Stuck up. So in an odd way, the Carlton version seems somewhat more faithful to the source material. The film fully utilises the Bluebell's veteran locomotives and rolling stock that were fully operational at that time, and even made use of a visitor to the line. Initially seeking the sole surviving Great Central Railway 04 number 63601, which wasn't quite restored in time for the filming, a call was made to the Bonus and Keneal Railway for the loan of North British Railway C-Class Maud. There may be some artistic license that the really anal armchair enthusiast could wibble about until the cows come home, like having a southeastern and Chatham goods engine pulling the old gentleman's train, but in the world of railway preservation, you've just got to make do with what you can get sometimes. The only things that slightly irk me about this adaptation, and they are very minor ones, are quite hard to explain. Firstly, the setting. Now, to be fair, the original story didn't have a specific geographical setting as such, Although the lettering of the fictional Great Northern and Southern Railway indicates that the family relocated somewhere between London and Scotland. It's also been said by the Yorkshire Post that the fictional town of Maidbridge mentioned in the book could have been inspired by some of Edith Nesbitt's nearby towns like Maystone and Sevenoaks, but if you grew up with the Jeffreys film very obviously set in Yorkshire and you can't get around the fact that this version was very obviously filmed in the home counties, you may not get quite the same sense of immersion. Also, the station in previous versions is very clearly out in the middle of nowhere, with not much else going on. Here though, while Horsted Canes, or Keens, or however you decide you want to call it, looks very nice, it looks more like the bustling junction station that it was in reality, rather than a country one out in the sticks. So you get the feeling that the characters may not seem to be quite as far out of their comfort zone as they perhaps could be. Secondly, and this isn't meant to be a disservice to Claire Thomas's performance, some of the added dialogue makes Phyllis a little more unlikable in this version. She's got the sense of well-meaning naivety down, and the family camaraderie she shares with her siblings is all there, but there's a few scenes where the script makes her more of an attention-seeking know-it-all. In the paper chase scene, she's needlessly vocal about being hungry, and when they find the boy in the red jersey passed out in the tunnel, she's pretty quick to change her mind about his condition. Well, I think he's dead. Stop that! I knew he wasn't. And what about this scene when they're trying to find out where the Russian gentleman came from? Are you Welsh? That was random. And this was before Anne Robinson slanked off the Welsh. I don't know, maybe I'm being picky here, but looking at each adaptation with an open mind, this one paints her as a bit more obnoxious. 
but to be perfectly honest, the issues I have with this one don't even come close to ruining it. It's still a charming, feel-good adaptation performed by people who are clearly throwing themselves into it and manage to warm your heart, just like an adaptation of The Railway Children should. So, which versions of The Railway Children have you seen? Which one's your favourite, and why? And if you're a theatre-goer, which version have you seen on stage, and what did you like about it? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below, with or without your choice of tipple in hand. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.